All rise. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. All who have cause to plead, draw near, give attention, and shall be heard. God save these United States, great state of Florida, and this honorable court. Ladies and gentlemen, Supreme Court of Florida, please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket today is the Florida Bar versus Rackison. Good morning, may it please the court. Uh, my name is Kevin Tynan. I represent uh, Mr. Rackison, who's also a co-counsel in the case and here before the court. My colleague, Linda Gonzalez, will be arguing for the Florida Bar. As this court knows, the misconduct in this case begins with the filing of a lawsuit or a complaint in May of 2009. Ultimately, that complaint was found to have been a sham pleading and was struck by a trial court resulting in about $42,000, $41,000 that my client had to pay opposing counsel. As counsel, a at, at what yes, point in time in, in the trial court litigation did opposing counsel indicate to the trial court that the pleading was a sham? We were talking about that this morning, Judge. Uh, the actual motion to strike for a sham was later on in the litigation, <coughs> closer in time to the actual court order. I don't believe it's in the record, so I don't have the exact time, but it was closer in time to the court's order, which is 520 of 14. However, they did file you know, responsive pleadings at the time the <coughs> lawsuit began. And we believe that for purposes of the statute, when we get to it, is the time frame. But in this case, referee, the referee in this case entered a summary judgment and held a sanction hearing recommending disbarment, and that's why we're here. I hope to address a couple of issues today. The limitation period, uh, and really an important question that comes up all the time in bar cases lately, is how do we value those trial court orders in a disciplinary matter? And lastly, obviously, the issue of sanction. If I can begin with the limitation period, which we do know comes from your rule, which is Rule 3-7.16A1. And the applicable portion of the rule says that a complainant, and in this case, Mr. Heron, because we're proceeding on his complaint in this case, must make a written inquiry to the Florida Bar within six years from the time the matter giving rise to the inquiry or the complaint is discovered or with due diligence should have been discovered. The bar complaint filed by Mr. Heron, and this is uh, in the record, is 12, 15, and 16, seven and a half years from the filing of the lawsuit, which is May 5th of 2009. From our perspective, Mr. Heron knew or should have known about those issues at the time that the complaint was filed. The fact that ultimately it struck down the line really doesn't change the notice to Mr. Heron. So it's our belief that... Counsel, let me ask you, yes, if, if this had been started not by the complaint of one of the litigants in the underlying uh, action, but instead by the Florida Bar, so let's say it worked like this. Uh, the trial court found um, after uh, litigation that this was a sham pleading, and in its order said, I am now referring this because I find this to be frivolous to the Florida Bar. Right. Um, would that create, would that be within the six year limitations period, assuming that was done in 2014? And that would trigger the second part of this rule, which talks about the limitation period as addressed to a complaint initiated by the Bar. And under so your only, analysis, yes. So only because this was, the complaint was made by one of the underlying litigants, is it outside the six year period? Is that, is that the argument? That is our argument, Justice. That, that seems a little odd and, and, 
and difficult to understand that somehow the limitations period would be different. In other words, take statute of limitations in any other context. It's whether it's discoverable or not discoverable. That's it. It's an objective inquiry. But here, we seem to be suggesting, or you're suggesting to us, that it really depends on who is the initiator. It's either the complainant, and if the complaint is made outside, then it would be what the complainant knew or should have known, versus if the bar initiates the inquiry, it's what it should have known, right? Correct. And, and here, though, Justice, it's we do have two different provisions, one for a complainant, not the bar, and one for the bar. And there is, and when you read the briefs and the record, you'll see there was an initial look by a different bar counsel that is not part of this proceeding. It predated and was closer in time to the court order. What do we I mean, make of, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, please. There's a provision in the rules that, it's it, the rules of professional conduct that prohibits an attorney from making or threatening a bar complaint or criminal action um, to gain an advantage in litigation. If, if the attorney did not wait until a judicial determination would your client have been reporting him for, you know, saying, well, he's, he's just trying to get, I mean, it, it, there's some sense in which you sort of take a risk if your initial assessment is this is completely frivolous, I'm going to file the motion, but until the judge rules on it, I mean, it, because of that other rule, it would be odd that we would have a rule that say, as soon as you look at something and make your initial assessment, the clock starts ticking. Would you address that? Uh, great question, and, and there really is no good time when you're in litigation to file a complaint or a grievance with the bar. And the rule, I, th and I think it's 483 without, I could be wrong on the number, uh, doesn't set a timeline on our obligation to report, just that we must report something. But again, if, it, if, if the, the limitation rule says it's discovered or due diligence should have been discovered, the triggering rate should be when I know. The, we are all, all of us in the bar, under an obligation that if we file something with the court, it must have a good faith basis in fact or law or an arguable point of fact or law. Correct. Correct? Correct. And that's assumed by both our oath and under the rules of professional conduct, correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. So how is it that, that a litigant on the other side, even if they believe something is wrong or a sham, is to overcome that, that, that assumption or presumption without having to litigate that point in front of the court? In other words, how is it, how does that trigger immediately upon the filing when we presume that people file things in good faith? I hear your point, and well, I'm not making a point. I'm merely asking no, no, a question. No, no, but, but I understand where you're going, Justice. And and for me, I I, I agree with you uh, that it's it's difficult. It's difficult to make that balance. But as a, you know, it's the it's a lawyer that's making this grievance who is presumed also to know all of the rules as well as the limitation. But you're a lawyer. I'm sure you've looked at pleadings from the other side and said, that's completely wrong. I mean, it happens to all lawyers, but we only know that after we litigate these things and a judicial determination is made that this is, in fact, completely wrong, and in this case, um, absent any, any support in fact or law. Well, and, and I primarily practice against the bar. And I, I know. I have that moment from I'm, time I'm to time. I'm certain you have, Mr. Tynan. And but, but Judge uh, or Justice, you know, it... Again, all I'm trying to say is your rule says they have six years, and it's when they knew or should have known. And this case did sit for a while where the parties didn't litigate, and that's in the record. You can see that. Um, and, but in 14, it was still closer in time to the, to the statute period. When he actually waited, it was well past you know, the date here is uh, they filed the grievance 12, 15, and 16. That sanction order was two years before that. Council, there's, there's nothing. Half Council you, what you're suggesting is that in 2014, when the trial court made the finding and entered the order saying that it was a sham, is that when the complainant should have filed the, uh, the bar complaint? Well, we think they should have filed it within that six years from the date that they filed the initial lawsuit which is May 5 of 2009. So that's our argument, but certainly it's a heightened awareness. Uh, but in 14, if he had filed, he, he, 14, you know, he 
-hmm. Well, that's when the trial court right. entered the order. But he still waited two years from then. No, I understand that, but that goes back to Justice Lawson's question, which is when should an attorney file a complaint with the bar when there, we have a rule that says you cannot gain an advantage on the other side by you know, bringing criminal proceedings or bringing an, any kind of proceeding against the other side. Right, and, and I understand that issue, but I still think the rule says we've got six years to do it, and I as a lawyer, knowing I have that six year period, should have done it sooner, and, and Well, and nothing, frankly, nothing prohibits an attorney from filing a 57105 uh, in court or in federal court or Rule 11. Right. Right. It's common ground, though, between the parties that a judicial determination that the, that the filing was done in bad faith, that's not, that's not a necessary part of proving the, the bar violation, right? Well, you don't have to wait until the court says it's in bad faith before, no, you don't have to wait. before there's been a violation. Right. You don't have to wait. And, and, and again, you know, it's a rule of reason. You know, when you look back at some of the, 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 the cases before we had a limitations period, like I think it's Walters or Waters, uh, you know, it was a rule of reason. And, and here, you know, this is seven and a half years after uh, the complaint was filed, two and a half years post the court order. And, uh, you know, we respectfully believe that it's outside the statute of limitations. And in this case, I mean, is it just from reading the judge's order, it seemed like the, the determination that it was a sham pleading was essentially just a matter of comparing the, the order dismiss, the, the order resolving the earlier case and then comparing the two documents, the, the, the subsequent complaint and then the earlier court order and saying the two things are inconsistent, well, right? It, correct, and, and, and in the record there's a transcript of that hearing which leads me into the next area. Uh, and it's, it's a January, uh, it's our Exhibit 10. Um, and what you'll see in that, it's, it, you know, we're, my client was entitled to an evidentiary hearing, that never happened. There is no testimony during that hearing. It is just lawyer argument back and forth. And you're right, Justice, the focus was comparing what my client filed and what was uh, Judge Crow's underlying order that uh, was being discussed. Uh, the second area I wanted to get into was what value do we give trial court orders or appellate court decisions? It, so, counsel, if I can ask about that. So sure. if this had been, let's fast forward a little bit and let's say there was summary judgment hadn't been granted and this was a, a trial um, on, the, on the merits, not just on, on sanctions. And at the trial, the bar really only put into evidence the underlying orders. Your client testified that he acted in good faith. And the trial court found uh, in its findings and recommendations to us that there had in fact been the same violation that we have before us today. We would, you would agree that there would be competent substantial evidence in that context based on on the underlying orders, correct? If, if we had not had a summary judgment right. and actually had a litigated trial in a bar case, I would agree because then it's the referee heard all of the evidence. So the only difference is, is that this was done by affidavit of your client as opposed to the testimony of your client, correct? Correct. How then are we not really in the same boat? In other words, the, the trial court had the same exact thing it would have had at a hearing. It would have had the same orders and it would have had your client's statements that it was uh, done in good faith which the trial court rejected and found by clear and convincing evidence that, that th this had been a sham pleading. I, I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding how procedurally we'd be in a different spot if this were at a trial as opposed to the summary judgment. Because if there was a merits of this case, there may have been more than just my client that came in to testify. One of the issues in this case But is that wasn't presented at summary judgment, right? No. And no. have, did you list any witnesses that would have testified other than your uh, client about I, good faith? I wasn't counsel at the time. I know there's a longer list, but I don't know what's, who's on okay. it right now. Um, but, you know, that could have occurred. We could have presented different testimony at an evidentiary hearing. But under the case law that exists, prior court orders and the underlying cases are certainly admissible. They're certainly given an appropriate weight. But one of the discussions we always need to have is the different standards of proof. In a bar case, it's clear and convincing. Normally, in uh, a trial court level, it's a preponderance, which is different, which means when you, when you look at the case law, like, and, and the only case that either party has cited that was a summary judgment in a bar case is Rosenberg. And in Rosenberg, certainly all that information was admitted. 
except unfortunately Mr. Rosenberg never filed an opposing affidavit. <clears throat> he never made the issue that he needed to make and then kept litigating, which was another problem altogether. But here, you know, we were cut off. My client never had an evidentiary hearing in the underlying trial proceeding. He went to hearing and never had an opportunity to be heard short of his affidavit when he lost on summary judgment. So that's part of our, our point. And as my time is running out, I just want to touch sanction for a brief moment, and we'll be back for a short rebuttal period. The, the referee is recommending disbarment. We know that is the most serious type of sanction that can be imposed, and this court needs to look at the underlying conduct, which is a, a, something that's been found to have been a frivolous pleading, a sham. There are some misrepresentation arguments, and when you look at case law, that's closer to 9091. And even with this court's philosophy of being stronger today, those 91 day cases are more recent. Thank you very much for being back. Okay, here. counsel, you have used uh, almost all your time, but I'll give you two oh, minutes. Oh, okay, I was watching that, it went yellow. I'm sorry then. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very much, Justice. May it please the court, my name is Linda Gonzalez. I represent the Florida Bar. I would like to address the statute of limitations issue that Mr. Tynan just discussed with you. If you accept Mr. Tynan's position that the statute of limitations began to run in 2009, it would logically follow that the statute of limitations would have ran in May of 2015. Judge Butchko's order was not affirmed until November okay, of 2015. But, but is it your position that a trial court's order must be affirmed before someone can file a grievance with the bar? The way the bar proceeds in cases like that, and we do get many cases where people say, oh, there's a frivolous filing or there's no merit to this. They want us to intercede into their case. The bar doesn't do that. The bar will allow the court to go ahead and resolve those issues. Otherwise, the bar will become a litigant for the complainants. We don't so want to do that. It, is there, has the, the court issued a tolling order on, no, on the statute of limitations? I'm sort of confused. I'm sorry, can you restate your question? Has the court issued a tolling order on the statute of limitations in this case? No, the court has not. Okay, well in 2014 when the trial court entered an order, at that moment in time, the law of the case was that it was a sham pleading, correct? That's correct. Okay, is the other side, should the other side not have then notified? Did the statute of limitations not start to run at that point? It is the bar's position that the statute of limitations began to run at that point because that's when the bar knew or should have known. Um, before that, all you have is a pleading and the attached, the attached final judgment. We have a case here where Mr. Rackusen and opposing counsel, for five years, they did nothing in the case. That's almost the entire period of the statute of limitations. So, but you waited then two more years. The bar waited two more years, correct? The bar did not have a case open at that point in time. Um, the bar did open, and it's not a part of the record, so I want to disclose that to you, but the bar did open a case in July of 2016. It was the Florida bar was the complainant. Mr. Rackusen did put that in his, in his um, brief. He did mention that. Um, that case was the Florida bar as the complainant. The complainants in this case didn't file a complaint until December of 2016. I believe they knew that the bar already had something open. Does it, isn't the standard whether the complainant, because this is a, a in situation where the complainant filed, whether the complainant knew or should have known about the violation? That is correct. Here the complainant, as I understand the testimony, knew that he did not participate in the conspiracy, knew about the underlying litigation because he was a party to it, and did not participate in the underlying conspiracy with Mr. Stewart because he didn't make any press statements and, and knew that he was not involved with anything that Mr. Stewart was doing, correct? That's correct. Wouldn't he have known that at the time that the lawsuit was filed or should have known it? He may have known that, but... Isn't that problematic for you? No, because when, we, when the bar receives complaints that there's frivolous litigation or misrepresentations, the bar doesn't actively say, well, we're going to start this case right now. The bar places that file on but monitor. But the, the question is not about what the bar did. The question is about the complainant, what the complainant did, if I, if I understood the it's question. It's 100% correct. And I'll, I'll just read the rule. It's A1. It's actually the rule that Mr. Tynan read, which is a complainant must make a written inquiry to the Florida bar within six years from the time the matter giving rise to the inquiry or complaint is discovered or with due diligence should have been discovered. So I understand the bar may not want to get involved in this stuff, and that may be really, really good reasons for doing so. I can't 
dispute that I understand that, but the rule says what it says, right? That's correct, and I believe it's my understanding that the complainants did know that the bar had something open already, so they didn't is that, file a, is that in the record before no, us? No, I'm sorry, Your Honor, that is not in the record. So the record before us is only the, the, 20, the, the December of 2016 complaint? That is correct. That is correct. However, what is in the record is Mr. Rackusen did state in his in his brief that the bar did have something open because when he came back from his suspension, he received a letter from the Florida bar regarding this matter, and that was in July of 2016, which would um, and, well, that and still it, would be after that still would be more than six years. That's correct. Uh, now, I'm, the bar's position also is that Mr. Rackusen filed this frivolous pleading, and he maintained it for five years. So that's, that's misconduct for five years. He may have filed it in 2009, but he continued his misconduct of, of keeping this litigation going for five years. So you're saying, it, you're saying it's a continuing violation that he did not withdraw the, app, withdraw the complaint at any point? That's absolutely correct. But is that the standard under, um, that's an interesting point, but is that the standard under, under, under uh, uh, 3-7.6A1 which says that the complainant must make it from six years from the time giving rise to the time giving rise to the inquiry or complaint. Um, that is not the standard, but what I would well, submit that, to the court is well, that, that, that's what it says in the rule. Correct. Right. Correct. And the bar's position is that what gave rise to this complaint is Judge Butchko's 2014 order. That's when the bar knew and the complainant knew but, for but, sure. But but, but the, I guess the the, the question is. When did the complainant know that the pleading was a sham? And my understanding is he knew from the beginning that the, the complaint was filed. I mean, I, that's correct. I guess I'm, my, my trouble that I'm having is that, that there does not need to be any trial court finding or order issued before someone can make a complaint with the Florida Bar. Correct? That's correct. I mean, so I'm having trouble understanding that. If, if I know for a fact that the complaint alleges a, B, and C, and absolutely A, B, and C are 100% categorically incorrect and false, then I can file a complaint with the bar at that moment in time. I don't have to wait for the, uh, a trial court or an appellate court to make a, a finding of fact, correct? That's correct. What would be the bar's position if uh, this particular bar member, after some time, after filing the initial complaint that was baseless, had a revelation moment and said, hey, this is, this is not supported by the facts of the law, and voluntarily dismissed the case. That happens. If it Mr. Happens. Rackison would have dismissed voluntarily the case. Voluntarily dismissed the case. That happens in practice all the time. Would it's there have been a legitimate bar discipline case against that lawyer? Well, it's my opinion that I don't think this case would really be before you today. Um, however, and so it's difficult to say if a bar complaint would have even been filed. But had a bar complaint been filed, we certainly would have looked into it. Um, and we would have, you know, probably brought it to the grievance committee and it would have been, you know, a, a grievance committee decision at that point in time of whether he violated the rule of filing a frivolous complaint. But it certainly would have been mitigated to the fact that he, he realize, oh, it's a frivolous complaint, all these things have happened. Realize that in five years, where he maintained this frivolous complaint, you have Laura Watson, who's charged uh, by the JQC, um, and that charging document pretty much mirrored um, the final judgment. So it's a lot a, of things it, were happening. I guess my, the, it seems that as a practicing lawyer, when a lawyer on the other side files something that is baseless, then it seems at times appropriate to, to let some things happen during the course of the case before you go filing a bar complaint against them. Correct. Uh, to have some kind of resolution in some way uh, of what transpires and have the lawyer an opportunity to correct something uh, before you file that disciplinary action against them. Uh, so uh, it seems very quick to expect a lawyer when a complaint's filed to go running off and filing a bar complaint before any discoveries been had or things further develop in the case. That's correct. And in this case, um, Mr. Stewart and Mr. Huron actually sent a safe harbor letter four months prior to the case actually being stricken and pointed out all these things that were happening, you know. Well, the, because uh, that was required under 57105. Correct. However, it wasn't valid because I think they were off, time, off with time, right. but the court did adopt it, uh, the 57105 on its own initiative and that's how he was sanctioned. So I want to ask you about the summary judgment uh, question. So yes. 
here, as I understand it, the bar submitted uh, in, in defense of the, of the charges, the, the orders, uh, the 2008, 2014, and the uh, four DCA orders, correct? That's correct. All right, and then in response, at least as to good faith, uh, an affidavit was made saying that, no, in fact, I, I originally made these allegations in good faith. Correct. correct. Um, and the trial court, based on that conflict, granted summary judgment to the bar, correct? That's correct. How can the bar grant summary judgment on an issue of bad faith where there's conflicting evidence? Okay, so two things I would like to address. First, there was also the complaint, the frivolous complaint, and the final judgment was also before the court. Right. So those were two additional things that the court could have independently looked at and said, yeah, there's no, no, no genuine issue of material fact. Um, secondly, you have the Florida Bar v. Rosenberg. In that case, it was pretty much a mirror image of this case. It was a motion for summary judgment. In fact, Mr. Rosenberg filed- Except, except there wasn't an affidavit, right? Didn't, isn't there's nothing in that case to suggest that there was no affidavit. It, I did not read that in the case. But there's nothing in the case to say there was an affidavit. Correct. Okay. No affidavits even mentioned in right. that case. Well, well, and that says, I mean, the, the opinion itself says here the facts are essentially undisputed. Correct. I mean, you wouldn't say that about this case, would you? I would say that according to the Florida Barbie Rosenberg, that he tried to put his good faith at issue and the court said that's right, not appropriate right, for you these, can't, for these you can't. How can you make, clearly if he says that there's good faith and you say that there's not good faith, then there is an issue of fact, correct? Well, not according to the Rosenberg case. According in the, to Rosenberg the Rosenberg case, case, there was no affidavit that suggested that there was good faith in dispute. In fact, the facts were undisputed. Right. Well, in this case as well, Mr. Rackusen admitted, so the court also considered his answer, and he admitted to all the material facts in the Barr's case. So that was an additional plea that the court considered. No, no, what he admitted was that these things happened. In other words, Correct. that the trial court issued its order, the right. order said this. I mean, he has to admit those things. Those are facts. Correct. But that doesn't get to the underlying issue of, of was there good faith or was there not good faith? And if you have, at summary judgment only, not a trial, because mm -hmm. I think if we were a trial, this would be a completely different question. Correct. But at summary judgment, if you have an affidavit on one side saying I acted in good faith and trial court orders which indicate lack of good faith, isn't there by definition a, a contesting of facts regarding good faith? Well, the whole, the, the underlying action, he was sanctioned under 57105. And under 57105, the lawyer should have known or knew or should have known that there was no material facts. Th there's certainly evidence to support your position. Correct. No one's saying there's not. The only question is, wasn't there evidence on the other side of that scale? And if there's even some evidence on the other side of that scale, doesn't that create something for which there needs to be a trial? I guess that's my question. I think the bar's position is that because there was so much evidence to the contrary that just because you make a statement that I have good faith doesn't necessarily mean that that's a material issue. Um, what, what was the, the factual basis that he asserted for his good faith action in filing a complaint when there objectively was no uh, factual or legal basis to do so? Uh, the factual basis that he asserted his good faith, is, if that's the court's question, is that he relied on Ms. Watson's um, representations to him. and. Um, <coughs> That he, that from the facts that he knew at the time when he filed the lawsuit in 2009, he acted in good faith. But clearly, you can see the order itself, the final judgment, would not give him that, that good faith that he asserts. And you, you can't just simply rely on your client's representations. As Justice, uh, as Justice Lux stated earlier, you have a duty as an attorney to apprise yourself of the facts. And he had the facts right in front of him the final judgment and everything else that was happening. Laura Watson being removed from the bench, being permanently disbarred. Uh, Kane Kane and Leonard were disbarred. Um, but before- So, so you're, you're saying that whatever his client may have told him, that that would not be a defense to filing a frivolous pleading when you had the final judgment and the documents to see that whatever she was saying was, was not true. That's so it would be correct. immaterial. That's correct. That could what? be gleaned from the evidence in front of them. The court can make that decision can, that, that there's no material issue of fact because just because he says, oh, I acted in good faith, you have to have a reasonable basis to say I acted in good faith. I don't, I don't believe the bar's position is that just because your client says, oh, you know, I, I won this case, you have the final order in front of you. You have all the misconduct, the final judgment that had all that misconduct, and then you have everything that happened within those five years, the charging documents, the JQC charging documents that basically mirrored the final judgment saying that she breached uh, you know, client uh, fiduciary duties. Um, one more question. Um, you said that there was an appeal to the third DCA. Did respondent challenge Judge Butchko's 2014 order in that appeal? 
No, the respondent never made an appearance. It was a different attorney who filed that appeal, but he was also sanctioned in that case. He could have made an appearance and defended himself, and he chose not to. He didn't even try. And in fact, in Judge Butchko, uh, that hearing, it's Respondents Exhibit 10, um, he didn't file a motion in opposition. He didn't attach anything as evidence, but the other party did. They attached you know, evidence to their pleading. So he chose to do certain things and not do certain things, I should say, and now he's claiming he didn't have an evidentiary hearing, when clearly it was, it was an evidentiary hearing. Can I ask you a quick question just to go back to something that Justice Paulson asked about? Because I think he raises an important issue about cases where um, it may not be clear at the beginning of a, of a case that something was filed you know, not in good faith. I mean, here, my sense is that this whole thing turns on a comparison of the 2008 order to the 2009 complaint. Um, do you have anything that, we, that would suggest that, th that more had to happen before someone could know that this was a, a sham pleading or that it wasn't filed in good faith? I do not, except for the fact that the way the bar proceeds, a case like this that's been held you know, in abeyance for five years um, and you know, it's almost the entire statute of limitations. I, I don't have anything. I think that it's clear that it was a frivolous pleading. I don't think that the bar would have proceeded um, based on how, um, standard board, board policy 15.55, which basically says that if there's litigation going on, we, you know, we'll monitor the situation until the conclusion of the case. But if we're, if we're worried about setting a precedent just for other cases, I mean, this, this is a case where you don't dispute that the facts were known at the time of the filing of the complaint. We're not suggesting, we, we wouldn't have to be creating a precedent that says that you have to run in and file a bar complaint, you know, the first second that the complaint is filed in a case where it's not clear, in fact, whether it's a sham or whether there was a good faith basis. You can let things happen. In this particular case, though, yeah. there was really nothing else of significance that happened after the, basically, the whether it was filed in good faith or not is something that we would know as of the time of the filing of the complaint. I think anybody, any reasonable person that would have looked at the final judgment in the complaint could have determined. I would agree with that, that it was a frivolous pleading. Um, but again, on the bar side, we, would not we still would not have proceeded because we don't want to influence the court and we don't want to become complainants, uh, litigants for the complainants. And oftentimes, we have to make that decision at the bar. And oftentimes, we do place those files so, on monitoring. So I mean, does that mean that there's sort of a de facto, even if it's not uh, an explicit part of the rule, I mean, is it, do you, is, do you basically take it as if, in the absence of a court finding of bad faith or frivolousness, the, the bar just wouldn't pursue something like that? That's correct. We would have waited till Judge Butchko ruled in that case. Um, in fact, both parties agreed to not litigate the case for five years. So they wanted to see what would happen with the appeals. And that appeal for the final judgment came out in 2012. But how, do, how does that sort of, um, when you read the rule and it says, a complainant must make a written inquiry to the Florida Bar within six years of the time the matter giving rise to the inquiry or complaint is discovered. At that moment in time, um, let's say when the trial court makes the written finding, um, let's say it goes through the appellate process, but at, at what point in time, how do you make sure that the, the rule is followed, the six-year rule? I mean, is, if, I mean, if the parties can agree to say, well, we're going to toll the the, the litigation, but you still have a statute of limitations that's running. Correct. So um, when we get the inquiry or when we know about it, and again, the bar's position is that that time started to tick in 2014. So based on the bar's position that the time started to tick in 2014, that's when maybe the bar would have receive something saying, hey, look, the court I mean, has under, ruled. Under the rule, it says that the Florida Bar must open an investigation within six years from the time the matter giving rise to the investigation is discovered or with due diligence should have been discovered. And the Bar's position throughout these proceedings has been that that was 2014 when it should have been discovered. We could guess and we can say, yeah, this is frivolous, but until the court rules and says, this is absolutely frivolous, this is absolutely done in bad faith, the bar would not have proceeded, and the bar but would not your, have known. But your position in this argument has been that uh, it was clearly frivolous if you read the final judgment, that you didn't need to make a trial, the trial court didn't need to make a finding, that it was so obvious and open that it was fraudulent 
that there was no need for uh, a trial court to make a finding. So Correct. which one is it? Well, it is, it is obvious to me, and I think to a reasonable person, it would be obvious that it was a frivolous filing. Um, however, I'm kind of stuck between the fact that if we would have looked at it back in 2009 when nothing was happening, we would not have done anything with regard to that. We would have waited because we would not have definitively known whether this was a frivolous lawsuit until Judge Butchko under her, uh, in her courtroom would have ruled. They had an evidentiary hearing. Um, Arguments were presented, evidence was presented. We're not going to step into the shoes, but to but answer the question about that, the rule. Doesn't that cut both ways? And because if you're saying that you wouldn't have done, the Florida Bar wouldn't have done anything until the trial court made a finding, then why should the other side have said, I'm going to withdraw my pleading as a sham, because it's a sham, if the trial court had to make some kind of finding because it was not obvious? No, I, I, my position is that it was obvious, and respondent should have known that he should have never well, filed then that why pleading. Did the, why did you have to wait till the trial court made a finding? Because the, the Florida Bar is not going to become a litigant to the complainants. We're not going to influence the court. Um, and a lot of the times when there is litigation going on in a case and there's a bar complaint to the bar, the position of the respondent is, oh, they're trying to influence the court or they're trying to influence me settling or they're trying to influence something. So, you know, we don't do anything. We, we monitor that case until the conclusion. And the conclusion in this case really would have been November of 2015 when the 4th DCA rubber stamped that, that Judge Butchko 2014 order. However, Judge Butchko's order would have placed us on absolute notice that this is frivolous. All right, uh, you've Sorry. more than exhausted your time. You. Um, if I can just say one thing. Very briefly. Thank you so much. The aggravating circumstances and misconduct found in this case are outrageous. There's misrepresentation under standard 8.1. Okay, you, you, you're way over time here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you're you making, so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, counsel, since uh, the all over 30 since, seconds. Well, since opposing counsel got five and a half minutes uh, extra, you'll get five and a half minutes extra. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief because I think the court understands what I think they're troubled with is how to apply the limitations period. Uh, one argument raised uh, that I want to address first before I forget is the issue of good faith. Before you address that, yes, if you would sir. address the continuing, the, the argument made by... That was going to be second. Well, that's the one Perfect. you need to put first. Thank you. I how is it not a violation it. every single day that your client is litigating a frivolous, again, assuming it is, mm -hmm. a, a frivolous pleading. I listened to that. We haven't discussed that in the briefs, and so this is really the only time we get to talk about it. It's a, no, a new argument for Barr about continuing. But as you heard, the facts of this matter is, because there were other things going on, the case was just stayed. They weren't doing anything for but, a five-year period. But as, as Justice Polston pointed out, many times, and, and this happens in completely good faith, an attorney files something and then through the course of litigation learns that it's not quite as it was and withdraws it. That happens a lot. Correct. Um, and that's as it should be. Um, that's the whole point of, of the litigation process. And why we have 57105. Here, there was no effort to withdraw. It may have been that everyone was waiting to see what the appellate court says, but every day this complaint was there, was filed, and was being affirmatively litigated in some court in the state of Florida. How, again, assuming it was frivolous, how is that on an independent violation of, of the bar rule that thou shalt not uh, 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 litigate a frivolous pleading. Well, again, just, just going back to the rule itself. Please, please, let's, you know, let's do that. Back, it's, it's the matter giving rise to the inquiry complaint is discovered. And again, we go back to it was discovered on day one. I know, but that's, I agree, that I have that rule right here too, but that's true as to day one. Okay. But you didn't discover it on day two when someone was litigating, and on day three when someone was litigating, and on day four. That's why statute of limitations in the criminal context for continuing violations mm -hmm. go on and on and on, even though the day one could have been discovered outside the limitations period. But because the criminal enterprise. That's exactly right. I understand. So I guess my question is, how is every day not a... In, in criminal law, we call this the unit of prosecution. How is the unit of prosecution not every single day that, that your client was litigating a frivolous pleading? Right. I, I understand the question, and it's a little hard to address for us because I understand the philosophy behind that question. But looking at it, again, you know, the case sat, and it's really, I guess, you'd have to look at when the case now is reawakened to be pursued, and there's a sanction motion, 
They're trying to get attorney's fees against my client. He's got to defend himself, not necessarily dismiss it. And they had what they thought was a good faith argument. Now, again, we've never really got far down the pike on what those issues are, but you know, the thought I want to leave you on is, is for good faith. We test that at the time that the action began, because that's really we're talking about the pleading. I know we've got to talk about what happened later, but at the time that the, the actual lawsuit was initiated, all you had is a lawyer talking to a client, relying upon a client, based upon the facts that they knew collectively at that time. And collectively at that time, they knew that there was no personal liability to Watson coming out of that litigation. Now, whether that's splitting the hairs in the wrong direction, but that's what they knew, and the court order shows that. <clears throat> and that's what they hung their hat on for the prime part of the litigation. Did the, did the complaint in this case characterize the violation as not just the filing of the complaint, but actually keeping it going for five years or however long it was? Uh, the Bars complaint, I don't believe so. I don't remember what Mr. Heron's actual complaint says. Uh, but the Bars complaint doesn't. And, and all of the Watson material, you know, her her, the, you know, the, when my colleague is talking about the JQC proceedings, those all happened later in life. They didn't happen at the time the lawsuit was filed. Uh, two last little thoughts that I want to uh, discuss, and it's in, we've briefed it, and I know you're going to look at the issue, on whether or not the summary judgment order in this court um, uh, by the referee uh, also disposed of the affirmative defenses that were pled, which were latches, stacking, and some other issues. We think that needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, finally, again, uh, seeing I'm uh, 20 seconds to go, appreciate the time. I know we don't get this audience very often to come before to talk to you on a bar disciplinary matter. But at the end of the day, when you look at, even if we lose everything else, when you look at the sanction, this is not a disbarment case based on the evidence in this case. Thank you very much for your time. All right, we thank you uh, both for your arguments. And the court will now move to the second case on our docket. The second case is Martin versus the state of Florida.